When in the course of human events, we, the people of the United States, all men are created equal, I have established justice. Not my president. I'm Terry, and I'm conservative for a reason, and uh, there are a lot of reasons. The reason all boil down to I study history, I study the founding documents. Um, a lot of people know what I believe because I'm pretty much a loud mouth and I, and I talk about what I believe. What a lot of people don't know and don't understand is why I believe what I believe. So this is uh, the opening discussion of why I believe what I believe. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I would sure like it if people who don't understand these things would start to get it. But the purpose is not to convince anybody to change anybody's mind. The purpose is only to explain my position and why I believe the way I believe. So that being said, um, we're going to start by talking about some of our founding documents. And I'm choosing today to talk about a couple of aspects of the Declaration of Independence and then go on to the Bill of Rights and I want to talk about how they tie together and that's very important in today's climate uh, because the Bill of Rights is exactly that, the Bill of Rights, we need to understand what that is, uh, what that means um, and, and it has everything to do with a lot of the big social issues of the day. So. That's kind of what we're going to be doing today, is talking about how those two documents tie together. Um, and by the way, those documents are in this little thing, and, and, and there's more in here. The Articles of Confederation, which was our, our original Constitution, is in here. The Constitution, the Declaration, uh, the Bill of Rights. Uh, this isn't big. Our founding documents are not huge. They intimidate people though, and so people don't uh, spend a lot of time reading them, studying them, looking at them, and they intimidate people for two reasons. Number one is they're written in Old English and it's very hard to understand what they're saying. The way that the founders tied the words together and use the flowery language in, in the 1700s. So it takes a little bit of getting used to to read what the flowery English is actually saying. And the other reason that they intimidate people is that there's a great big body of law built up around them. Uh, that body of law is huge and it's gigantic and Thomas Jefferson saw that only around 50 years after this, these documents were written 40, 50 years, something like that. Um, and, and he made a comment about the body of law and, and the interpretations that grew up around these founding documents. And I want to I read you what he said about it. And he said it in a letter to a guy named William Johnson uh, in, on June 12th of 1823. <clears throat> he said... On every occasion of constitutional interpretation, let us carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted, recollect the spirit manifested in the debates, and instead of trying to force what meaning may be squeezed out of the text or invented against it, instead let us conform to the probable one in which it was passed. So what he's saying there is there's all this interpretation and all this body of laws and in a lot of cases what it is is people squeezing uh, and forcing meaning out of the text, inventing meanings against it, and he's saying, look, if you want to understand what America is about, read the documents. Don't read the interpretations of the documents. Okay? So, let's get started. And I'm going, to, I'm going to start with the Declaration of Independence. Uh, everybody should know this. When I was in school, I don't know if they still do it, you got extra credit in school as a kid if you could memorize some of uh, the important parts of these documents. So this might sound familiar to you. Um, and, and you'll be able to read it on the screen as, as I'm reading it to you. So follow along. And this is the opening of the Declaration of Independence. 
when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for people to dissolve the political bands which have, which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature, nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. That's the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. I want to go back to one phrase that I'm going to be coming back to a couple of times as we talk, um, and that is the phrase, the laws of nature and of nature's God. Okay, now. I'm just going to continue and read part of the next paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit, and we'll go back to that first statement where that, that, that I highlighted from the first paragraph, the laws of nature and of nature's God. You have to think about what the founding fathers were thinking when they wrote that, and, and when Thomas Jefferson wrote those words, he was acknowledging that there is a higher authority. There, there is a higher authority than a government of men, and that is the laws of nature and of nature's God. Now, we go back to what it says in the second portion of that. In the second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. By their Creator. Not by the government, okay? Understand that. By their Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, when he said life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, he was saying that these are some of the rights that King George had violated that caused the the Patriots to want to break away from England. All right, and he doesn't dwell on them here because that's not the purpose of the document to expand on those and to explain fully what life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness actually means. Even the main body of the Constitution doesn't do that because the main body of the Constitution is there to tell us how the government should be organized and how it works. These were defined in detail in the Bill of Rights. That's where the Declaration and, and the Bill of Rights tie in together. Now I want to explain only one word in that and that is unalienable. Inalienable is a different word, okay? Now, you may not even believe that unalienable is a word, and I've been called out on that before, and yes, it is a word, and it is different than inalienable, and I'll explain it to you. An inalienable right is a right that you can yield to a higher authority. You can give it up to a higher authority, but an unalienable right, which life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is recognized as being, is granted by that higher power. So you can't give it back to, to the person who gave it to you. He gave you a, a, a gift, and you can call it uh, the laws of nature, nature's God, so you can call it natural law, you can call it God's law, you can call it whatever you want. Um, they're simply saying there is a higher authority, nature, nature's God, whatever, uh, granted you unalienable rights. Now, the next thing that it says after it says that the, among the rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men. 
and what he's saying there is one of the primary purposes of a government which is to secure those basic natural God-given, if you will, rights. Here's where the Old English of the 1700s gets to be a little bit hard to understand. What does secure mean? I'll tell you exactly what it means. Safeguard and protect. The purpose of the government in this context is to safeguard and protect unalienable rights that are endowed upon us by our Creator and that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you know what that means? That means that the government doesn't grant those rights. That means that when they are broken out and defined in the Bill of Rights, the government is not saying we're granting you the right of free speech. They're saying that it's already an unalienable right. It's a right you've got before us. It's a right that comes from a higher power. The Bill of Rights in that context is our commitment that we're not going to mess with it. We're going to let you have your right of free speech, your right of assembly, your, your right of dissent, and, and all, all the rights that are there in the Bill of Rights. They're not granted. They're protected. They're calling them out and saying these are the rights that are given to you by a higher power that the government will protect. The next question is if these rights are granted by a higher authority, can the government violate them? And the answer is yes. Uh, they're violated constantly on the globe in, in a lot of countries. You have absolutely no freedom of speech. The government has taken it away, said if you're going to say certain things, you're going to jail, and you're going to jail for a long time if you speak out about the government. Uh, that was the specter that the Founding Fathers lived under. Uh, they didn't want anybody in this country to have to live under that specter. And they said very specifically in a lot of their writings, you can speak out against us, against your government, if you want to. We're not going to stop you. The, re the Founders used this, the, this terminology to recognize and come to the American people with the commitment that they are not going to violate these rights, that if they were to pass laws to violate these natural rights, they would essentially be superseding that nature or nature's God. And they didn't want to be guilty of that. They felt that no government should ever claim superiority over nature, nature's God. So they said, we're not going to interfere with the certain things that they listed in the Bill of Rights. And by the way, one of those amendments, the Ninth, Amem Ninth Amendment, says this isn't all of them. These are the ones that are most critical today. We're making a commitment, but there may be more that we're not going to violate. This is important. This is going to be a foundation for everything that I say in almost any one of the videos that I'm going to do in the future. And I have been very careful not to mention the Second Amendment, but it is the hot button issue. I've already got a series out there on the Second Amendment, and it's getting bigger. Uh, go and listen to it with this understanding that when they wrote the Second Amendment, they recognized that self-defense and defending our country was a right granted by a higher authority to the individual people of the country. And you'll get more of that when you listen to those specific videos. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Uh, this is the first foundational video, and I hope you come back and listen to some more videos on my YouTube channel. Go ahead and like the video down below. Just hit the thumbs up or the thumbs down if you don't like it. Uh, put some comments in. I will answer them. It's important that we interact. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you. I'll see you next time.